Hello to you. I do hope you're well. Welcome to this A-level religious studies video. Today we're looking at the ontological argument for the existence of God. Now in this video we'll be covering everything you need to know for the AQA paper one where we are assessed on our knowledge of the philosophy of religion and ethics and so we'll be covering the two AOs so that we can confidently answer both a 10 mark and a 15 mark question on the ontological argument. So we'll be understanding and examining and selling ontological argument and then of course we'll be evaluating his argument we'll be looking at those strengths and those weaknesses we'll also be considering the argument status as proof so can it be said to prove god exists and we'll be looking at its value for religious faith very significant, of course, that Anselm wrote this as a prayer, that he was the Archbishop of Canterbury and he was very much immersed within the religious language game. And so we'll talk about the argument's value for theists and whether it could potentially persuade an atheist. So lots to talk about today. Just to look at the bigger picture, as you can see here, the ontological argument um, can be assessed on paper one, where we are, of course, being assessed on our knowledge of the philosophy of religion and ethics. And these are the philosophy of religion topics that could come up on the exam. So let's kick off with the key terms, shall we? And the ontological argument is an a priori argument. A priori, remember this is meaning prior to experience. There is no empiricism in this argument. It is all prior to experience. So an a priori argument is an argument that is based on logical deduction and is prior to sense experience. So if the premises of that argument are correct, then the conclusion must be true. Um, this is, of course, unlike the teleological and cosmological arguments, which are a posteriori. And you could definitely be comparing them if you're asked about the argument status as proof, whether a priori or a posteriori arguments are better. A necessary truth, then, is a proposition that could not possibly be false. A necessary thing is something that could not possibly have failed to exist. And Anselm's argument is all about saying and showing God as a necessarily existent being. By definition, he must exist. A contingent thing, on the other hand, is something which does not exist necessarily and so could have failed to exist. And, you know, you'll remember from our revision for the cosmological argument, Aquinas' third way also looks at this question of contingent and necessary things. An analytic statement is a statement that is true by definition. For example, a bicycle has two wheels or a triangle has three sides. It is true by definition. The word triangle itself means three angles or three sides. And so the statement is true by definition. Whereas a synthetic statement is a statement or proposition whose truth or falsity are determined by sense experience. So synthetic statements depend on sense experience, whereas an analytic statement can be known as truthful a priori because it is true by definition. A predicate then is the quality or property of an object or subject. The predicate gives us information about the subject and we'll be looking at Kant's criticism that existence is not a predicate. Uh, the ontological as a key term then, well, what does ontological mean? Well, it's the Greek word for being. And so in the context of this argument, it refers to the being or nature of God. And Anselm is going to say that God's nature is that he necessarily exists that you can't separate existence from God. And Descartes will use the example, you can't separate a mountain from its valley in the same way that you can't separate existence from God. He is a necessarily existent being. And then reductio ad absurdum. This means to reduce to absurdity. It's the style of argument. And we'll be looking at how it comes into play when discussing and critiquing the ontological argument. So just a couple of key scholars we'll be encountering today. We will, of course, be talking about St. Anselm of Canterbury. Very important to remember, he was an Archbishop of Canterbury. He was not creating this argument from a neutral point or from a neutral starting point, I should say. He was immersed in that theistic language game. He was already committed to his faith. 
We'll be talking about Gaunilo, a monk who obviously criticized Anselm, which is interesting, the fact Gaunilo himself believed in God, but he believed that the argument was unsuccessful. We'll be talking about Immanuel Kant and his criticisms of ontological arguments, Descartes and his support of the ontological argument, his own versions. And then we'll be talking about Karl Barth as well towards the end of today's video, when we talk about who this argument could persuade. Is it an argument that will just confirm what a theist already believes? Or could this argument actually persuade an atheist that God actually exists? with no empiricism involved at all. So a very, very interesting argument for us to be studying. So here's your starting point. Really important that we know. Anselm of Canterbury was an 11th century monk, theologian and archbishop. Now, I really hope that emphasizes to you the fact he was a man of faith. He was committed to Christianity and he was completely committed to belief in God. And that is illustrated in his motto here, I believe in order to understand. Anselm believed that belief should precede understanding so that you should first of all believe in God and then find a way to understand him. So he did not want to understand God before he said, OK, yeah, I now believe in God. He believed no pun intended here, that he believed in order to understand that faith, that belief precedes understanding. Therefore, his argument is actually written as a prayer. So as I say, he is not starting from a neutral standpoint. He is immersed in this theistic language game. As I write here, Anselm is a committed theist whose argument is anchored in the theistic language game. And so when we're talking about its status as proof, we might be saying, well, yeah, absolutely. It's great proof for someone who already believes in God and for someone who accepts Anselm's definition of God. But if someone doesn't have faith in Anselm's definition of God, then this argument won't work for them, because if they don't accept his premises as a matter of faith, then they will not accept his conclusion as being true. So really interesting to just start off with this awareness. Anselm was a monk, theologian and archbishop. He said that belief precedes understanding and we know that his argument is actually written as a prayer. So who was Anselm trying to persuade and who will be persuaded by his argument? Let's find out. Any thoughts you've got throughout the video? Just a little side note, please let me know down in the comments. Please do share your thoughts on this argument, any quotes that you know about this argument that you think are relevant, keep them posted down below. OK, so I also want to talk about the fact this is a deductive argument, unlike the teleological and cosmological arguments, which are inductive, which means they're probabilistic and they work from experience and they're all about making inferences based on observations. The ontological argument is deductive. And this is interesting because it has a lot more certainty because deductive arguments intend to guarantee the truth of the conclusion. If the premises of the argument are true, then the conclusion must be true because you are deducing something from the premises. Now we'll be looking at what Anselm's premises are and we'll be asking whether you have to share his belief in God in already it already, excuse me, in order to accept his premises. But just at this starting point, remember, it's a deductive argument. It's a priori. It does not involve any sense experience. He is trying to prove that God exists by thought alone. It's a rational argument. It's based in rationalism rather than empiricism. So as we know, the word ontological or that keyword ontos means nature, being or essence. And so the argument is based on the claim that God's existence can be deduced or it can be proven from his definition. That once God is correctly defined, there can be no doubt that he exists. So to put that another way, that God by definition must exist, that his definition alone proves that he exists. And this is a criticism um, of the argument that Anselm is effectively trying to define God into existence. And that is not something you can do. But just as a starting point, again, it's an argument based on the claim that God's existence can be deduced or proven from his definition alone. There is no reference to evidence gained through empirical observation. It is all about the definition. It is a priori. It's about the nature of God proving that God necessarily exists. 
So here are the three claims that the ontological argument makes. The proposition God exists is a priori, it is deductive. It can be known to be true without reference to sense experience. So the proposition God exists does not need to be proven, according to Anselm, by observation. You don't need to get in a science lab and find out whether it's true. You can know the truth of this proposition a priori, so prior to any experience, and using a deductive method. It's all about thought. This argument is about thought alone. It's all about the definition of God. The second claim, in the proposition God exists, the subject God contains the predicate exists. So God must exist. And this is the idea that Descartes really illustrates well, that in the same way a mountain cannot be separated from its valley, that God cannot be separated from existence. You cannot conceive of God as not existing. In the same way that a mountain cannot exist without a valley, God cannot be without existence. So if you can think of God in your mind, then you have to know that God exists. And your final point, that God's existence is a necessary truth, not a contingent one. So remember, contingency is where something depends on something else, whereas God's existence is a necessary truth. God is necessarily existent. Now, we're using lots of words here, aren't we? And we're going to start to unpack and explore what they mean. So the starting point for this argument is Psalm 14, where we read, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. And Anselm's argument is his response to this. So his argument is addressed to the fool in the Psalms. It is his response to the fool in the Psalms who has said there is no God. So the fool has actually said there is no God. So the fool has an idea of God. They've got a concept of God in their mind, haven't they? If they're talking about God, then they have a concept of God. And this is the starting point, as I say, for Anselm's argument. So Anselm has this definition of God. He defines God as a being than which nothing greater can be conceived. So that is his definition. If he was right in the dictionary, that is the definition he'd put down for God. A being than which nothing greater can be conceived. Now, a question we've got to ask is, how did he arrive at this definition? And is that definition correct? You know, does everybody share that definition of God? Anselm believes they do. He said even the fool would accept that definition of God, that God is a being than which nothing greater can be conceived. So this is kind of the first flaw in his argument. Anselm is assuming that everyone accepts his definition of God. And certainly some people do, many people do, you know, Theists, like Anselm, would probably accept that definition of God. But if we want to start thinking about RAO2, we're going to start thinking, does everybody actually accept that definition of God? For example, the dictionary does not contain that definition of God. But, I want the word definition again, this is Anselm's definition. And this is the first assumption he makes, that God is a being than which nothing greater can be conceived. Okay, so... Here is his argument in really simple form. I think it's important we know his argument in its simplest form. I will give you some extra points in a minute, but I just want us to know his argument in terms of two premises and a conclusion. So here is the really simple argument. Premise one, God is the greatest conceivable being. God is defined as that than which nothing greater can be conceived. Now, premise two is that it is greater to exist in reality than to exist only in the mind. So we can all agree that God is this greatest conceivable being, Anselm says. He is that than which nothing greater can be conceived. Anselm then says, well, it is greater to exist in reality than to exist only in the mind. Therefore, he says, as the greatest conceivable being, God must exist in reality. So God, by definition, 
must exist because if he didn't exist in reality as well as in the mind he would not be the greatest conceivable being because we could conceive of an even greater being that also possessed existence that also existed in reality and not just in the mind and therefore by definition god must necessarily exist in reality so as i say the argument is basically saying that if you can think about god then god must exist in reality by definition. So I want to give you a little bit more detail on this. I want to break it down now into actually six premises and our conclusion. So he starts off with that definition. Remember, he's starting with this definition that is that God is the greatest conceivable being, that than which nothing greater can be conceived. This is a definition, Anselm says, which even a fool, the fool in the Psalms, understands in his mind, even though he does not understand it to exist in reality. So he's assuming that even an atheist understands God as a concept, as that than which nothing greater can be conceived. Now, Anselm correctly knows that there is a difference between having an idea in the mind and knowing that this idea exists in reality. For example, a painter has an idea in his mind of what he wants to paint. But when he has painted it, that idea now exists both in his mind, that idea of the painting, and in reality, the painting that is then actually in front of him. And Anselm says it is greater to exist both in the mind and in reality than to exist only in the mind. So that painting is very nice in his mind, in the painter's mind, but it is much better when it's actually been drawn or produced or whatever the word is. I'm no art expert. I've not got a creative bone in my body. Um, but what he's saying is it's greater for that painting, not just to be in the painter's mind, but actually be there in reality, because then he can sell it and make some money from it and get it hung in a nice gallery. Yeah. So it's greater to exist both in the mind and in reality than to exist only in the mind. So if God only existed in the mind, I could think of something greater than God who only exists in the mind, namely a God who existed in reality also. So if we're saying that everybody accepts that God is the greatest conceivable being, he says God must therefore exist both in the mind and in reality. So the definition of God proves that God exists in reality. And so if God is the greatest conceivable being, God must necessarily exist in reality, because if God only existed in the mind, he would not be the greatest conceivable being because you would be able to conceive of or imagine an even greater being who not only existed in the mind, but also existed in reality. So. There's his conclusion that in order to be the greatest conceivable being, God must exist both in the mind and in reality. So there you go. God exists because God is the greatest conceivable being. And every single person thinks that way, according to Anselm, then God necessarily exists. Otherwise, that wouldn't be true. There could be an even greater conceivable being. Now, I hope you're seeing here, this all depends on someone accepting Anselm's definition of God. If you don't accept that definition of God, if your definition of God is that God is a made up concept, this argument isn't going to work for you, is it? So he is assuming, as you can see from premise two, this is a definition which even a fool understands in his mind. So he is trying to say that it is logical, it is evident, a priori, that God exists not only in the mind, but also in reality. So if you can think about God, that proves God must exist in reality as well. OK, now the whole point that he's making here, isn't he, is that it is better to exist both in the mind and in reality than just one of them. So that example of the painter and his painting, that painting when it's in reality is much more valuable than when it was just in the mind. It was so much greater to actually exist on a canvas than just alone in the artist's mind and imagination. And so this is at the core of Anselm's argument that existing in the mind alone is not the greatest way to exist. In order to be the greatest, in order to be the best, something must exist not just in the mind, but also in reality. And so God necessarily exists in reality because he is 
the greatest conceivable being. If he only existed in the mind, then he would not be the greatest conceivable being because something else could be conceived um, as greater if it then existed in reality as well. Okay, so first criticism. We've got a bit of a dialogue going on here, okay? And Anselm is actually going to respond directly to this criticism. So it's important that I introduce it to you at this stage when we are still very much in AO1 territory. So Gaunilo was a Benedictine monk again in the 11th century. So he was a contemporary of Anselm, which is why he was able to directly respond to him. And he wrote um, in defense of the fool. So he wrote in defense of the fool in the Psalms, who Anselm had been targeting, if you like, and taking down in his original ontological argument. Now, so important, guys, Gaunilo was a monk as well. So he was not a Richard Dawkins type character. He was a monk as well. So he believed in God as well, but he believed Anselm's argument for the existence of God was flawed and it was wrong. Interestingly, so did St. Thomas Aquinas. He did not like the ontological argument. And this is great for our AO2, because we can say even people who do believe in God don't think this is a good way of proving the existence of God. So Gaunilo's criticism uses a parody of Anselm's argument. So he wants to show Anselm how ridiculous his argument is. The idea that you can define God into existence or you can think God into existence. He wants to show Anselm how ludicrous and how stupid that is. And so he gave an ontological argument for the existence, not of God, but of a perfect lost island. So he used the exact same structure as argu of argument, excuse me, as Anselm, but instead of talking about God as the greatest conceivable being, he wanted to talk about the perfect lost island. And he tells his reader, he says to Anselm, imagine an island than which no greater island can be conceived. So he's literally replacing God in Anselm's argument with an island. And he then uses Anselm's structure to illustrate its flaws. So he's using Anselm's own argument against him to show Anselm how ludicrous his argument is. So he uses the same format. Premise one, it is possible to conceive of the most perfect lost island. It is Anselm says, as we know, greater to exist in reality than to exist only in the mind. Therefore, the most perfect lost island must exist in reality. So if I can think of this greatest conceivable island, if we apply Anselm's logic, that means that island must necessarily exist. So if we all just imagine our greatest conceivable island, mine's going to have a lot of green tea on there. Do you know what I mean? few Kit Kats, you know, that kind of thing. Imagine the island. By Anselm's logic, it is greater to exist in reality than to exist only in the mind. So that perfect island in my mind cannot just exist in my mind. If it is the greatest conceivable island, it must necessarily exist in reality. And of course, Gaunilo's point is that it's not true. Empirically, we can then prove that doesn't work because we can go and we can travel around the world and, you know, get up in a spaceship and look down on the earth and we can see that island with loads of green tea and Kit Kats does not actually exist, very unfortunately. Otherwise, I'd be moving there. And so his point is the argument doesn't work. Anselm's argument, its structure is flawed. Just by saying that something is the greatest conceivable thing, Therefore, it must exist in reality as well as in the mind that cannot define something into existence. You cannot use that to say something must exist in reality. And so he has taken Anselm's argument. He's taken Anselm's structure and he's used it to show Anselm why he's wrong using this example of the perfect lost island. Now, the approach that's being taken here with these arguments is called reductio ad absurdum. So it's trying to reduce something to absurdity, to show why it's absurd not to believe something. And Anselm is trying to say to the fool, it is absurd that you don't believe God exists. And my argument shows you why. But actually, Gaunilo is suggesting that Anselm's argument is flawed because it could be used to prove the existence of an endless number of supposedly perfect or greatest conceivable things. What about perfect cricket balls, perfect trees? The real fool 
Gaunilo says, is anybody who argued something into existence in this way? So trying to argue a perfect island into existence, no matter what argument I use a priori, I can never imagine or argue that island into existence. If it doesn't exist, it doesn't exist. Me saying, but it must exist because it's the greatest conceivable island. And that means it must possess existence. That doesn't change a thing, does it? So he's saying we can show a posteriori that this perfect island does not exist. So Anselm's a priori argument does not work. Now, what Anselm says in response, we will talk about this more in a minute, is that Gaunilo, you've got it wrong because you're talking about contingent things. He says, you're talking about contingent things. An island is contingent. A cricket ball is contingent. Trees are contingent, but God is not. God is a necessarily existent being. And so he says the argument only works for God as a necessarily existent being. You are trying to apply my argument to contingent things and that's why it doesn't work. So he's got a really good response. And here it is for you really clearly. Anselm responded to Gaunilo's criticism in the second version of his argument, in the ontological argument 2.0. He writes, God cannot be conceived not to exist. God is that than which nothing greater can be conceived. That which can be conceived not to exist is not God. So here's the key difference. Islands and anything else in the world is contingent. God is necessary. You will see a lot of links here to the third way that Aquinas proposes, although Aquinas doesn't like ontological arguments. So Anselm argues that you cannot compare God to an island or indeed to any other thing in the world because God is a special case. So you can't use the argument for anything but God. This is because islands are contingent, meaning they cannot exist necessarily, whereas God is necessarily existent. Now, again, this all depends on accepting Anselm's definition of God and believing in the same kind of God of Anselm, um, because we could argue the words necessarily existent have no real meaning. Um, but for Anselm, his key defense is that God is a special case. So Gaunilo's criticism doesn't work because you can't compare God to an island because islands are contingent, whereas God is necessary. And so necessary existence is only a predicate of God and not of things. Now, this really makes me think of language games and the idea of falsification and the idea of the death of God by a thousand qualifications. That's what this really reminds me of, shifting the goalposts, you know, in response going well God is a special case is there ever a point when Anselm could accept that God doesn't exist I don't think there is because he's so immersed in his theistic language game but you know to be fair to him this is quite a clever response isn't it you know well hang on Gaunilo your argument doesn't work because islands are contingent whereas God is necessary God is a special case so I do think you can use that in the exam and you should use that in the exam as a great rebuttal to Gaunilo's criticism okay what about some support for this argument then? Well, Descartes, our lovely rationalist who said cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am, agreed with Anselm. He liked his argument. And this is because Descartes, who was a rationalist, so remember he loved a priori arguments. He, you know, he was very skeptical of the senses. He believed that, you know, they, he agreed with Plato, they can deceive us, they can't be trusted. So he was a great fun, fun, a great fan, excuse me, of a priori argument. And he said that God is defined as the supremely perfect being. So again, these ontological arguments really do depend. They really do rest on these particular definitions of God, don't they? And he said, this is the definition of God. He is the supremely perfect being. And he said, therefore, because of this definition, he must possess all the perfect predicates so all the perfect qualities, if you like, or characteristics of omnipotence, omniscience and omnibenevolence, because if he didn't have all of these perfect predicates, he could not be the supremely perfect being. And he said that God, as the supremely perfect being, must also possess existence, because if God did not possess existence, he would not be perfect. And so, again, by definition, 
God must exist because God is defined as the supremely perfect being. So therefore he must exist because if he didn't possess existence as a predicate for Descartes, then he would not be perfect. And so the definition would be wrong. Again, this depends on accepting his definition. So this again depends on having faith in a particular definition of God. If you don't believe that God is the supremely perfect being, you're not going to follow the rest of the argument, are you? But he's very much saying in this deductive argument, again, that if God is defined as supremely perfect, he must possess existence because if he didn't, he wouldn't be perfect. And here is a lovely bit of primary source from Descartes, okay? And this is really easy to follow. And I think you'll find a couple of really nice lines in here you could weave and integrate into your own answers in the exam. So he says, it is quite evident. So he says, you know, come on, you should be able to see this. It's obvious that existence can no more be separated from the essence of God. So he says that existence is part of the essence of God or the nature of God, the DNA of God, than the fact that there is three angles equal two right angles can be separated from the essence of a triangle. So he's saying in the same way that a triangle by definition has three angles and three sides, he says by definition, God has existence. You cannot separate existence from God. Or he says that the idea of a mountain can be separated from the idea of a valley. So in the same way, you can't separate God and existence. You can't separate a mountain and a valley. You can't have a mountain without a valley. You can't talk about God without talking about God existing. Hence, he says, it is just as much of a contradiction to think of God, that is a supremely perfect being, lacking existence, that is lacking a perfection, as it is to think of a mountain without a valley. So he's saying here that a supremely perfect being cannot lack perfection. That would be a contradiction. That would be, thinking of my GCSE English days, a bit of an oxymoron, wouldn't it? Saying that, uh, you know, you've got a supremely perfect being who lacks perfection in the same way you can't say you've got a mountain without a valley. So God cannot be thought of as not existing. He is, again, as Anselm said, a necessarily existent being. You cannot think of God as not existing in reality. OK, so if you have clicked on the link to get a copy of the PowerPoint, you may now want to print off this table and do the knowledge check. Yeah. If you've not got a copy, do not worry at all. I would just recommend pausing the screen here and working your way through these questions. If there's anything you're not sure on, maybe go back in the video, check your textbook, check your notes um, and just make sure you feel really secure on your AO1 to this stage. Do you know Anselm's definition of God? So important, guys, that we know that. Do you know who his argument is addressed? to do you know that really succinct summary we gave do you know Gaunilo's perfect island criticism and then Anselm's response and in that box I'd just be writing in big bold letters God is a special case back off with your island with your contingent island and then what is Descartes version of the ontological argument make sure you include there the example of either a triangle or the mountain and his own definition of God OK, so what are the strengths of this argument? What can we say succeeds about Anselm's argument? So we can say it has certainty as a deductive argument. If the premises are true, so if you accept the premises, then the conclusion must be true. It logically follows on that we can have an absolute guarantee. So whilst inductive arguments are only probabilistic, you know, because they're making inferences based on experience, deductive arguments give absolute certainty. So we can say as I say if those premises are true we can be sure we can be confident the conclusion is true the argument does not rely on empiricism or observation which is criticized by thinkers such as Plato who said that the body is a source of endless trouble for us we cannot trust our senses and our observations because they deceive us this argument avoids that this argument does not rely on your senses, on empiricism, on observation, none of that. So we completely avoid that. So we can be sure that the conclusion is certain to be true.
So if the premises of a deductive argument are true, then the conclusion itself must be true because deductive arguments give absolute certainty. So again, I'll say it one more time. If the premises are true, the conclusion is guaranteed to be true. So it has certainty. The ontological argument is a deductive argument. If it succeeds, it is absolute proof of the existence of God, whereas, of course, teleological or cosmological can only ever give you um, likeliness cannot give you that complete confirmation and that complete guarantee. And then the ontological argument is a deductive argument. If it succeeds, I've just said that once, so I'm getting so carried away. <laughs> so I want to say again, it's so important. If it succeeds, it is an absolute proof of the existence of God. And then finally, just to recap that bit, this is much more reliable and certain than inductive arguments which can only give probability. Excuse me, I've just repeated that at you, haven't I? But I got very excited about that. And then my neighbour started mowing the lawn. So that did distract me, but I can't use that as an excuse. <laughs> Let's soldier on whilst they get busy doing their gardening. Okay, so your next point, guys. Anselm's ontological argument is supported by Descartes, as we've said. So Descartes was a mathematician. He was a scientist and a philosopher. He was a very busy man. He asserted, didn't he, that it was quite evident that God must exist by definition. And he used those great examples of a triangle and then mountains and valleys to illustrate his point. Now, we can say that this backs up Anselm's argument because this support from a key Enlightenment philosopher is a strength because it gives you a more up-to-date, if you like, piece of support. So we can say, as you know, a strength of Anselm's argument that there is a later version of the ontological argument with a great example from a really um, high profile distinguished philosopher that can give support and credibility to ontological arguments. So they weren't just a thing of the 11th century, but actually we've got Descartes and his version as well. So whenever you bring in another philosopher who has backed up what someone like Anselm has said, you give a really good strength for that argument there because it shows more people have agreed with them and have done their own work, which is consistent with the original. So yeah, that would be a strength. However, there are weaknesses, as you can imagine, there are criticisms of this argument and that's what we're gonna take a look at now. If you're following on with the PowerPoint, you're very welcome to print off the table and fill in the criticism, explanation of criticism, and then response to criticism table, so that you've not only got what the criticism is, but then you've also got a criticism of the criticism, if you see what I mean. So you can really show the examiner that you are an expert at evaluation. So you deserve that A star, because you really understand this argument. So Gaunilo, of course, is going to give one of our best criticisms for the ontological argument. He says the perfect island example demonstrates that Anselm's argument does not work. So as we know, so I'll just repeat this, Gaunilo's criticism uses a parody of Anselm's argument. He gave an ontological argument for the existence of a perfect lost island. So he replaced God with the perfect lost island. Um, he says to imagine an island than which no greater island can be conceived and, of course, uses Anselm's structure to illustrate the flaws of that structure. And Gaunilo shows that Anselm's argument could be used to prove the existence of an endless number of perfect objects. So a perfect cricket ball or tree, for example. And so, and I love this line, the real fool is anybody who argued something into existence in this way. So to try and argue God into existence is a foolish thing to do. You can't do it. We can show a posteriori that the perfect island does not exist. So Anselm's a priori argument does not work. But of course, your response to that criticism from Anselm is that you can't apply his argument to contingent things because islands are contingent, whereas God is necessarily existent. The argument cannot be applied to an island. God is a special case. So that is Anselm's rebuttal to that criticism. OK, another criticism then, and this comes from Kant, one of my favourite philosophers to study. We talk about him a lot in ethics. 
He says, and this is one of his criticisms, that you cannot use existence as a predicate. So Kant is responding to Descartes, okay? So he is not impressed with Descartes' um, ontological argument. And he argues that existence is not a real predicate. And he says, this is because saying that God exists adds nothing to our understanding of his essence. There's no difference between our concept of God and our concept of a God that exists. He said that real predicates would give us new knowledge of a subject. To simply say he exists does not add anything. So basically saying that God exists is not going to prove that he exists. I can't just say, I'm trying to think of an example now, unicorns exist. Just by adding that as a predicate to say they exist cannot then mean unicorns exist. So you can't just say something exists and say that that adds knowledge. I can imagine the concept of God, but that doesn't mean God therefore has to exist. I can imagine what God would be like if God existed, but that doesn't mean God therefore has to exist. And he used the example of the currency of his time, of a hundred sailors. And he said, you know, take the case of a hundred sailors. So I could give you different predicates of the coins. I'm trying to find, here's a two pound coin, guys. Okay, here it is. Who carries money these days? Anyway, I've got a two pound coin here. When's it from? Got the queen on it still, God bless her, from 1999 ancients like me so it um it has he said it is round it's metallic it's gold it has the image of the king there are things that he said about a sailor he then said to simply go the sailor exists that adds nothing i'm gonna go well yeah but what does that tell me about the sailor so he is saying that existence is not a real predicate. You need to tell me something about the properties of the coin, about the nature of the coin, that it's round, metallic, gold, has the image of the monocon, for example. He says that to say they exist or he exists adds nothing. So you cannot use existence as the predicate that proves something exists. It is not sufficient as the predicate or a predicate that therefore proves something must exist. And he goes on to say logic alone is insufficient. We need sense experience in order to truly understand something that exists. Now, here's a extension of that. And I think this is where we really get into our strong AO2. He says it's only if there is a God that God will exist necessarily. Anselm's proposition doesn't prove God's existence. So I want you to just have a read of this with me. He said the ontological argument fails because it omits the word if, and that is obviously a very small word, but a very important one. He said the argument should read, if there is a God, if there is a God, then God will exist necessarily. He said the statement God exists necessarily may be logically true because that is how Anselm defines God, but it does not follow that there really is a God. You cannot define God into existence. So he says you have to be hypothetical about this. You have to say, if God exists, then God exists necessarily because that would be the nature of God, but it's only conditional if God exists. And so you need to add that word on. And of course, if you then say, if there is a God, then God will exist necessarily. That undermines the argument itself, doesn't it? Because it takes away its power and its authority, because it's then just working in hypotheticals. But what Kant is saying is this argument will only work if God exists. But the argument cannot prove that fact. That argument can tell you what the nature of God would be, that God would be necessarily existent if God existed, but it can't prove he exists. You would need to have some other source of evidence that God exists beyond this argument. His proposition, his statement alone, his premise alone, his definition alone cannot define God into existence. They are insufficient as proof. Okay, and another criticism for you. The argument depends on accepting Anselm's definition of God. And we've spoken about this a few times in today's video, haven't we? So we know that the argument is a deductive argument, that if it succeeds, if the premises are true, it is proof of the existence of God. We know if those premises are true, then the conclusion is guaranteed to be true. But of course, 
This depends on accepting the premises of the argument, which includes his definition of God as that than which nothing greater can be conceived. Anselm is assuming that even the fool accepts his definition of God. However, and this is so important, not everybody shares his definition of God. And so we could say the argument falls at the first hurdle because it depends on accepting his definition. The same with Descartes. If you don't accept that, then the rest of the argument is meaningless to you. And I want to use that word very carefully and consciously linking it to language games and verification principle. It's meaningless. It's pointless. If you don't accept that definition, the rest of the argument is pointless for you. So the argument only works if somebody accepts Anselm's definition of God. So it's a very subjective, can I say that, argument in terms of it only works for certain people who already believe what Anselm believes. Now, you know, Anselm might be happy about that. He might have written the argument as a declaration of faith for theists. But if he's trying to persuade atheists, he's got a bit of a problem, hasn't he? Because his argument requires pre-existing religious faith. It requires you to be someone who agrees with him that belief should precede understanding. If somebody wants understanding before they're going to believe or they want proof before they're going to believe, this argument isn't going to do it for them. In order to accept his definition of God, you need to already be part of his theistic language game. So the argument might work for people who already believe in God, but it does not succeed at persuading those who do not. And by the way, many people who do believe in God do not think this is a good argument. For example, um, Aquinas. For example, Gaunilo. So Kant said, as we've just seen, the argument only shows that if God exists, he exists necessarily. And Karl Barth, and this is where he comes in. Hello, Carl. How are you? He concedes this. He's obviously a really committed theist, but he says the argument was not intended as proof for God's existence, but it was the result of a religious experience that Anselm had. So he says it's not proof, but it's the product of a religious experience. Now, that, of course, changes everything because it means the argument is not a successful proof for the existence of God. It says the argument is something else entirely. It is the result of a religious experience rather than being something that proves God's existence. So Karl Barth is conceding that. And so you're starting to see now that this argument is being attacked from all angles, if you like, not only by atheists, who are rejecting the definition in the first place, but also by theists who are saying that the argument cannot successfully persuade somebody a priori without any further evidence or explanations. Okay, so that does bring me on to the argument status as proof. And we are going to keep talking about Karl Barth because he said the argument is about faith, not logic. Excuse me. Now, this is a problem, obviously, because um, we know deductive arguments are meant to be about logic. And Karl Barth has now come along and he said, hang on a minute, this one's not. So he believes that Anselm is not trying to prove the existence of God. So <laughs> its status as proof is um, diminishing, is it? Is it not? Because he said, instead, this argument is the result of a religious experience that Anselm had, in which God revealed his nature as that than which nothing greater can be conceived. So Karl Barth said the argument is therefore true for those with faith because it is an expression of their faith. But it's not going to be sufficient for those who don't believe in God already. And this is consistent with Anselm's motto that belief precedes understanding. But of course, it's not then going to support the argument as having status as proof. So why would someone say it does offer proof? Well, you could say that if someone accepts Anselm's definition of God, this deductive argument offers certain proof. So it would confirm to a theist what they already believe. So it's good proof for somebody who already believes in God, who operates within that language game, who is within that form of life, who is themselves a monk, for example, an Archbishop of Canterbury, a theologian who is committed to faith. And you could also say it is a priori and therefore it does not rely on fallible sense experience. So if those premises are true, then we can have complete guarantee that the conclusion is as well, whereas inductive arguments can only give probability and likeliness. 
So, you know, we're talking there about the technicalities of the argument and why it would be successful. But we're also recognising it does only offer proof to certain people. So even when we're saying it does offer proof, we're still limiting that. We're still clarifying that by saying it only offers proof to certain people. Whereas on the other side, the argument does not offer proof. Kant, for example, said it only shows that if God exists, he exists necessarily so it cannot offer proof for god's existence it can just tell you about his nature if he did exist and we can say it only works if someone accepts anselm's definition of god so it is therefore limited another one i'd add there it only works if you share his definition so it falls at that first hurdle kind of thing that never mind the conclusion being guaranteed if the premises aren't accepted in the first place you're not even going to make it to the conclusion of the argument. So never mind the fact that deductive arguments guarantee us proof. And then we need to also know about its value for religious space. Now, I think this is the most interesting bit because um, Anselm did have religious space. Karl Barth said this argument was the result of a religious experience. And so clearly for somebody with religious space, you'd be thinking, yes, this argument has value. It confirms what you believe. But actually, as we've seen from Gaunilo, for example, it's not actually thought of that highly by some theists. So who would say it does have value for faith? Well, we could say, well, the argument is written as a prayer. So it is very valuable for faith because it's an expression of faith, as Karl Barth has identified. It is the result of religious experience. It's an expression, a declaration of faith. So we could say because it's immersed from the start in the religious language game, it has value for those with faith. And of course, Anselm's motto, I believe in order to understand, reaffirms this. Um, Anselm believes that faith precedes understanding. The argument is the result of faith. It is the product of faith not proof for faith. And so Karl Barth would be great to bring in here saying that the argument is about faith, not logic. And so it has real value for someone who operates within that theistic language game, who participates in that language game. And so it's really valuable as a prayer, as a confirmation, um, as a declaration of what you believe God to be like. However, we can say it doesn't have value for faith because of fetism, which we've spoken about for all three arguments, that faith alone is required in religion. Faith does not depend on reason. And of course, it's an argument that does use reason. It's trying to use logic. You do not need a logical argument to show God's existence. You don't need to be faffing around with definitions and premises and conclusions. You should simply believe by faith alone is an interesting point and then Aquinas said it is impossible to know about the nature of God and so he would obviously say his um cosmological argument for example is better because it's based on empirical evidence and so that's more valuable for religious faith in the modern world as opposed to talking about the technicalities if you like of God's nature of his definition so that leads us to looking at how this applies in the exam. So you may be asked a 10 mark question about this to examine Anselm's ontological argument for the existence of God. And of course, you may be asked one of those 15 markers as well. And it's a statement, Anselm's ontological argument fails to prove the existence of God. I don't know why there's so many apostrophes there, by the way, <laughs> to excuse me, uh, evaluate this statement. So you might want to have a go at those questions. And you also might want to leave a comment, a question, a thought in the comments below. Please feel free to do so. All that's left to say is thank you for watching. Good luck with your studies. And I hope to see you again soon. Take care. Bye bye.